Hello, everybody. Welcome to our midweek Refresh Adult Bible Study class. We are continuing our journey through Romans. We are more than halfway through. And we are in the ending part of this arc between chapters 9, 10, and 11. And I told you that in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he covers the same topic, which is the rejection of the Jews and how this came to be and the acceptance or the calling of the Gentiles. And so in this, he's established already that God has the power to accept and God has the power to reject whomever he chooses. Remember in our last chapter, he told the stories of Isaac and Ishmael, Esau and Jacob. Both of those were brothers of the same father, biological brothers, the same lineage. And yet God chose one line and rejected the other line. And then he goes down to bring that to the fact that the Jewish nation rejected Christ, rejected him. How did they reject Christ? He came as the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies. Isaiah, for unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Isaiah was prophesying of the Messiah, and the Old Testament Jews knew this. They knew all those prophecies were pointing them to the Messiah. But when Jesus came on the scene, they missed the moment of the Messiah. They completely lost the moment. And because they lost it, then God said, okay, because you've rejected my son as the Messiah. He then turns to the Gentiles and said, will you receive me? And we know that they did. And so therefore the plan of salvation was opened to the Gentiles to be saved. Now, Paul establishes all this, but in the midst of all this, he also comforts the Jews. I want you to know that just because God opened his arms to the Gentiles does not mean that he completely rejected the Jews. He said any Jew that will believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that taketh away the sins of the world, and obey what they believe by faith, you are able to have this New Testament salvation. And this New Testament plan of salvation is what the Bible refers to as circumcision of the heart. Because remember, the root of, of Paul writing this letter to the church at Rome is simply the fact that the Jews were demanding that the Gentiles who had received the Holy Ghost, been baptized, had obeyed the plan of salvation, also be physically circumcised. And so Paul is established throughout these few chapters of Romans that we've been through that circumcision in the New Testament under this dispensation of grace is circumcision of the heart and is not a physical act. It is a spiritual act when you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 11, Paul is going to wrap up this arc that he's been talking about by reminding the Jews once again that they were not totally rejected. He's going to establish in here, he's going to say it a couple of different ways, but he's going to remind them that there is a remnant, there is a people that believed, and so therefore God did not completely reject. Um, and then, then he's going to talk about the fact that this rejection was never final. It was just simply a moment when the gospel was open to the Gentiles, and through that, perhaps the Israelites, the Jewish people, would be provoked to wanting to be involved in this plan of salvation. I want you to know that the restoration of the Jews is a desired event. God is always looking for that moment when his chosen people recognize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Savior, who came to take away the sin of the world. He was the Lamb of God. And when they recognize him as that and not just another prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah, there is going to be a revival among the Jews. And God has determined that this day will come to pass. Many of them do at this moment, but he calls that the remnant. But there is going to come a day when there is going to be a great revival. So let's jump into Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Paul's favorite little phrase, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Want ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, 
how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So even though Paul has been walking these Jews through their past history and how they rejected God because they rejected his son, Jesus Christ, he now reminds them that God never completely cast away his people. And he does a quote from Psalms chapter 94, verse 4. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. And that was spoken of in that day. And then it was a prophetic utterance of the day that actually the Jews in Rome were living in. And Paul tells them, says, we know this is true. I'm even a Jew. I'm one of the Jews who did not reject Christ. So we know that this concept of the fact that the Lord would not completely cast off his people, not completely reject the Jewish nation is true. I'm living proof of that. And he's writing to the Jews at Rome who are also living proof of that. I am a Jew that obeyed just like you is what he was saying. And of course, he lists his pedigree because he's underlying to them that we are part of that prophesied remnant of Israel. And then in verse 2, Paul alludes to the fact that God foreknew that there would be a people who would not reject the Messiah. There would be a people. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. He could see that some of them we're going to believe. And when you believe, God will not cast you away. And that's what he said. I knew that there were some that were going to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and obey by faith, following that gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection that he went through. And when they did, those are the people that he foreknew that would be sustained. And then in the midst of verse 4, he introduces this story, which we know very well from the Old Testament. And he uses the example of Elisha. Remember, Elisha had that great victory on Mount Carmel where he defeated the 400 prophets of Baal. They cut themselves. They tried to get Baal to answer by fire. Uh, Elisha builds the, the fire, lays the sacrifice, pours a bunch of water on it, and God's fire comes down and consumed, and it's this great victory. But in this story, Elisha then comes down off the mountain and Ahab goes home and tells Jezebel that 400 of the prophets of Baal are gone. And Jezebel sends a message to Elisha that I'm going to take your life. And she basically said, it, it'll be, you're not going to believe it, but the sun is not going to go down tomorrow until I take your life. And so Elisha, under this death threat, flees to the wilderness and sits down and is despaired and basically is saying, I'm the only person out here trying to do anything for the kingdom of God. And in verse 5, Paul even says, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. In other words, they've chosen to receive that grace, that unmerited favor of God. And therefore, they are called the elected. They're the foreknown. They're the remnant. They're the reserved. They're the people who believed and did not reject Jesus Christ. And so God set them aside for himself, that gratuitous, that they accepted that gift that he offered for them. And Paul is making the point that the rejection of the Jews was not total. There are some that believe by faith and obeyed the gospel. And then he makes a definitive statement to those Jewish Christians in Rome by reminding them they were also saved by grace. Because as I said, they are the Jewish remnant that were prophesied about. And if they were saved by grace, if your obedience came through grace and belief in what Jesus Christ did and who he is and what he did on Calvary, and you followed the plan of salvation, then works has nothing to do with it. Your physical circumcision was not the act that saved you. So if it didn't save you under this dispensation of grace, then you have to believe that your salvation came by this act of Jesus Christ and not by the works that you did. And he said, basically, if it had come by your works, then what was the purpose of grace? 
Grace would have been negated. It would have been no longer grace. It would no longer have been a gift or an unmerited favor from God. So he's basically saying it can't be works because you leave out grace, right? So he's basically tying that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, to, 8 through 9 says it this way. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I want you to understand this. When, when James talked about faith plus works, he's talking about repenting, baptism, Holy Ghost. He's not talking about physical circumcision. But these Jews were trying to say that physical circumcision had to be done along with the gospel. Paul is saying that was a work, a work alone. That work alone never brought you what grace brought you. And you can't have, say, this work matters and grace matters. Because if you say that physical circumcision, this work matters, you negate grace. You take it out. Why did God go and shed his blood if your shedding of your blood would do the job? And so what he was saying was that act of grace is the powerful thing. That act of grace basically pulled that act of work under it. Nobody under grace has to fulfill that physical circumcision anymore. And then in Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 8, he goes on to say this. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And now, Paul makes this contrast between the Jews that rejected Christ and those that received it. He reminds them that most of Israel is blind. They cannot recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 10, this was also foretold of, of a time when the Jewish people would not see the Messiah. He said, for the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets, your rulers, the seers hath he covered. Basically, you couldn't, he's blinded you to the point that you couldn't hear the prophets. You couldn't hear the seers. You couldn't hear the rulers, the people that were speaking you the truth. You were asleep. You could not hear what they were saying. Deuteronomy 29, 4 said it this way. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And if you look there in verse 8, there's a portion of that scripture that's in parentheses. And that's kind of where he's quoting these two references there. But at the end of it, he says, unto this day, so that they will know that there's many of Israel, even at this day that I'm writing you this letter to the Jews at Rome that are still asleep. They're still asleep. They're not awake. They don't know who the Messiah is. They slept through the entrance of the Messiah and they missed believing in him. Then he goes on in Romans chapter 11, verses 9 through 10. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Now, if you go and you study where David said this in the book of Psalms, you will see that David is also speaking prophetically in the scripture before that about the death of Jesus Christ. He doesn't even know that he's saying that, but he is. We find this, Psalm 69, verses 21 through 23. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, when did that happen? When Jesus was on the cross, he said, I, I'm thirsty. And that's when they gave him the sponge that was soaked in vinegar, but he refused to drink it. And this is a prophetic utterance in the book of Psalms about that moment on Calvary. So we know it's pointing us to Christ. We know it's pointing us to Calvary. We know it's pointing us to what he did there. Verse 22, let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continue to shake. So we know that this is pointing to Jesus and what he did. And then prophetically, 
David says, what you thought was going to feed and sustain you, the law, became a snare for you. What should have provided safety and welfare for you has become your trap. You are ensnared and entrapped in the law so much that you missed the Messiah. That's scary to think about and dangerous. You rejected me because you were so entrapped and ensnared by the law. And because of that, your lives are going to be shaken. Your loins are shaken. Everything in your life is not going to matter. Everything in your life is going to go away and it's going to be shaken out. What a scary thing. You're so consumed with the law that you missed the Messiah. Very scary. And then Romans 11, verses 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? He's fixing to turn it now. He's been pretty tough on the Jews, but he's going to turn it. Have they stumbled that they should fall? His favorite line, God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentile, how much more shall their fullness be? Now, Paul's fixing to introduce this circle, this circle that he's going to talk about. The Jews' rejection led to the salvation, the opening of salvation to the Gentiles. The acceptance of Jesus and the salvation of the Gentiles left led to jealousy on the part of the Jews that now they weren't just the chosen people and then led them, a remnant of them, into salvation, right? And so he's making this kind of circle effect. The Jews did not fall completely. And he says that, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. The reason for their stumbling, the reason for their lack of unbelief is so that now the gospel is open to the Gentile. The fall of their salvation, he says that that way, is come unto the Gentiles. But then in that last line of verse 11, he also says, why did it come to the Gentiles? To provoke them, the Jews, to jealousy, to get them to see that they missed the Messiah and to accept and receive the Messiah. Look at this in Acts. shows an example of this. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contra contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Jews. But seeing ye put it from you and judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we have turned to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. In other words, as many as chose to believe gave, got eternal life. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all that region. That is a beautiful example of what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He had lived that because that was him and Barnabas back there trying to teach them. The Jews. Goes to the Jews. Paul always went first to the Jews. He always went to the synagogue to speak. The Jews were the, at the synagogue. They would reject it. If they rejected it, he would go out on the street and preach to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would receive it and the Jews would become jealous. What are you having to do with them? And so he's, he's bringing about this circle. He's helping you see this circle. But the whole point of God doing all of this was one thing, that salvation would be brought to all mankind. It's this full circle concept. And then in verse 12, Paul states that if the fall of the Jews, when I say that, that's the rejection of the Jews leads to the entire world being enriched. He called it the riches of the world. Jesus Christ, the rejection of Jesus Christ by the Jews led to the entire world being able to receive what Jesus Christ had done for them. That's riches. The ability to be saved, the power to be adopted came to the Gentiles. Then how much more, and this is what he states at the end of that scripture, how much more then will their fullness be? When the Jews come back, if we can rejoice and see how much their, 
rejection of Christ enriched the world, gave the salvation to the Gentiles. How much more beautiful and full will it be when all the Jews, when the majority of the Jews come back into the knowledge of Jesus Christ? So once again, remember, he's writing to these Jews. He's not leaving them without hope evangelize the Jews try to win the Jews because it is as great it, it just makes it more full now and now you understand those scriptures how great it is that we dwell together in unity all believing the same thing it's even more beautiful when everyone re- believes and receives and then Romans 11 13 through 15 for I speak to you Gentiles now he's been speaking to the Jews. he's going to turn to the Gentiles in so much as I am apostle I've been sent To the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Verse 14, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, which we know he's speaking of Jews, he is a Jew, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from death? Now he's stating He's going to state this several different ways. So don't get bored with this circular conversation of the rejection of the Jews, open to the Gentiles, jealous of the Gentiles being open, Jews come back to him. This circle he's making. And he's admonishing, he's been admonishing the Jewish brethren about their history. But now he also speaks to the Gentiles and he's telling them, hey, I'm your apostle. God sent me to the Gentiles. So I can make this because of my office, because of what God has asked me to do. But then he makes the point in verses 14 and 15, the conversion of the Gentiles was meant also to bring about the restoration of the Jews. Because God said, I'm going to do this to provoke them to jealousy. I'm going to provoke them to discover what you've discovered so that they can be restored. And then all of you together can be reconciled unto me. So Paul says, I'm even saying this in the hopes that there's some Jews out there that will emulate will want to be like you, Gentiles, see the revelation of Jesus Christ, react upon their belief by faith, and receive this. And he's, he's telling those Gentiles, you should want this as well. Why should you want this as well? Because remember, when, the, when we all come together, it's going to be a fullness. There's going to be r- greater riches than we've even known. And he even lets them know at the end of verse 15, when you bring them back, when we get those Jews brought back into this, there's going to be, it's going to be amazing from life to death. Can you imagine snatching somebody, saving somebody's life from death? And so he's, he's encouraging those Gentiles. You don't just stick with your people. You witness to the Jews. Jews, let's try to get as many of our Jewish brethren saved. And then in Romans eleven sixteen, for if the first fruit be holy, The lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, he is going to begin a great spiritual analogy here from a tree aspect. And he mentions this concept of first fruits. First fruits are the root of all things, the beginning of all things. The first fruits are the Jewish people. They were chosen first to be the chosen people. They are the first fruits of all people that are born and saved, and that's why God sent Jesus as a Jew, sent him so he could speak to them as a Jew to try to get them to understand. He sent the gospel to them. And even Jesus made reference to that throughout the Bible. Remember when the Gentile woman came to him to to release her daughter? And he said, listen, I'm not here for you right now. I'm here for the Jews. And she said, yeah, but, you know, even a dog gets some crumbs that fall every now and then. And Jesus turned to her and goes, wow, what faith. You believe that even the crumbs I have to offer you can deliver your daughter. And he stepped out of his dispensation of the Jews. He stepped out of just taking the message to the Jews and met her need, which is an amazing thing. And that's why that story is in the Bible. But he says, if the first fruits are holy, then whatever comes from the first fruits should be holy. If the children of Israel, to the best of their ability, kept the truth until they came to Jesus Christ, him being that first fruits of them was holy, then everything that comes from Jesus Christ, we know we're his lineage because we're adopted by him, should also be holy. Making this concept that whatever is in the root is what should bear fruit. Keep that in mind. And when he talks about the lump, He's talking about anything made from that. That's why the Jews are very big on kosher. They have to know where all the materials that make their food come from. Because they believe that if you have a piece of fruit that wasn't 
prepared the right way, you maybe use pesticides on it and you put that into your food, it's in your food. And so he says the lump is also holy. If the fruit is holy, the lump is holy. If the fruit is holy, then whatever you make from it, whatever happens from it is holy. And then he uses the concept, if the root is holy, then the branches, anything that springs from the seed of that root must be holy. So he bought, basically the apostle Paul is saying, the children of Israel started out as the root. They were holy. They were separated. They were consecrated. They were receiving the truth. And if the Jews continued that way, then all of their branches that grew from that root would be holy. So he, he's making this point of the beginning and he's setting this up for what he's fixing to say. Because then in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 22, this is what he says. And if some of the branches be broken off, that's speaking of the Jews, and thou, talking to the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. He goes on, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Verse 19, thou will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. The prideful voice. Verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest basically here by faith. Be not high minded, but fear or reverence. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. So Paul established in verse 16 the fact that the root has the the seed in it and everything that grows out of the root should continue in that same manner of holiness and wisdom. But then he comes to this and he says, but there were some branches that were broken off. Now he's going to tell you in just a minute why those branches were broken off. But then for a minute, he says there were some branches broken off and those broken branches gave room for the Gentiles, which he called a wild olive branch. They, they weren't pruned. They weren't, uh, you know, they had nothing good in them. But he took something, he took a branch from them, and he grafted. He tied those two branches together so that they would begin to grow together, right? So he's talking to the Jews there. And he grafted you into this Jewish lineage, to this Jewish tree. And he's comparing this Jewish lineage, the 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 Jewish church, the body of Christ, if you want to say it, as an olive tree, a good olive tree. Now, if you go and study olive trees, they're, they're used throughout the Bible. We know olive oil was used to make all of the anointing oils. It is a very sacred tree in the eyes of God. It's a very durable tree. An olive tree can grow in an arid desert and produce fruit. It's a productive tree. Olive trees are some of the most productive trees in the world. They, have, they make excessive amounts of things out of an olive right? It's highly valued, highly favored tree. Um, but then he compares the Gentiles to this wild olive tree. And if you look at a wild olive tree, it's the total opposite. It is the most worthless tree. It, it doesn't produce fruit you can eat. It doesn't produce, the only thing they ever found to do with a wild olive tree was they would take the leaves and they would wind it together to make the cornets that Caesar would wear, those, those things upon their head. But God said, you Gentiles were wild. You were unrestrained. You were sinful. You were unrepentant. But because some of my branches did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they were broken off. They fell off. They fell. They rejected the tree and they fell. But when they did, I looked around and I saw your potential and I cut pieces of you and I engrafted you into this tree, right? I gave you an opportunity. If you go read the Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, he was the first Gentile that Peter preached the message to and received it. And that engrafting process of the Gentiles into the body of Christ, into the adoption of the Jewish lineage, if you want to say it that way, 
took place because they believed, they had faith, they obeyed by salvation. And it changed their nature. And now that wild branch, once it became grafted into the tree, it begins to take on the properties of the tree. And the tree, the root, the strength that's in the tree will actually change the fruit born by that wild olive branch. Okay? But then he turns to those Gentiles in verse 18 and he says, now hold on a minute. Don't get too puffed up. Don't get too boasted. He said, don't boast against those branches. Don't, don't make fun of people that fall. Don't, make, don't look at that and judge those people, those Jews that didn't receive salvation. He said, when you do that, that's your fruit. And it lets me know you've not truly been grafted back to that root. The root has not been influencing you. You've not allowed it to change the fruit you're bearing. Boy, I hope you can see all that. I'm really trying to, to help you understand the scripture setting, but that's so beautiful. If you've been engrafted into the church, but you're not allowing it to change or transform you, then you've not truly been engrafted into the church. And I often say there's a lot of people that go to church that aren't Christians. There's a lot of people that go to church that don't believe anything. But when you are truly as a Gentile engrafted into that tree, you and you let it change your nature, your fruit is going to show that. So he said, hey, 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 guys, in verse 18, don't get puffed up. Don't boast against those branches that fail. Because if you do, you're showing you don't have the root. And then he reinforces that in verse uh, 19. You, you might say, well, they were broken off that I may be grafted in. That's true. But then in verse 20, he says, but they were broken off because of their unbelief, not just so you could be grafted in. And you got grafted in because you had faith in God. And he said that should cause you not to be high-minded is what he called it, puffed up, proud, boastful. But it should cause you to fear. What does that mean? Have reverence. Be honored that God did that. I revere you, God, because you thought me worthy enough to graft me into this tree. And then in verse 21, he makes the concept you need to be fear and reverence like I just told you and appreciative of the fact that you were grafted in because if God did not spare his chosen people who did not believe he's sure not going to spare you the wild olive branch that doesn't believe if he broke off the branches that didn't believe of his chosen people he will break off the branches of the wild olive trees that don't allow the grafting process to take place he will cut that away because the, the what matters to God is belief and faith in that obedience and he cautions the Gentiles to continue in the goodness that belief that you've exhibited continue to let that rule your life otherwise you could wind up the same way the Jews did cut off from God so he uses this beautiful analogy of the tree and he's not done yet because he goes on in Romans 11, 23 through 24. And they also, speaking of the Jews now, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to that nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. So he talked to the Gentiles and cautioned them about how they got to be a part of this tree being grafted in as a wild branch. Now he's going to go back and let them know the Jews. And he's also speaking to the Gentiles here that this same principle applies to the Jews. Those Jews who were not believers and because of their unbelief were cut away from the tree and fell. If they choose to believe, God will pick them up off the ground and he will graft them back in to the truth. God is not a respecter. Salvation is open to the Jews and the Gentiles. And then he reminds the Gentiles, if God was willing to take a wild olive branch and graft it into a good olive tree, how much more would he want to pick up the natural branches, those that originally fell from the tree off of the ground and graft them back in. Oh my goodness, I love this. Don't you see this gardening of God take place here? And basically God is saying, 
They fell because of unbelief. I looked at the wild olive tree, which was the Gentiles, and I said, boy, they've got faith and belief in me. So I picked them up and I grafted them in to this good olive tree. But when I look around and if I see some of my Jews that fallen away because of unbelief, turn to me and believe, I will pick them up as well and graft them back in. And he's letting those Gentiles know what it takes to be saved, not physical circumcision, spiritual that was what got you grafted and produced that fruit but he's also letting those jews know even though you all rebelled and rejected god if you believe god will bring you back in he's just showing that circle of the plan of salvation of god bringing all mankind under that and he and god is a great desire i mean it would be like your children if your children had walked away from God and you were able to witness and save a bunch of people, you would be very happy for those people you witnessed and saved. But what would it feel like when your child came back into, into truth? If you were able to witness to your child and they were to come to church and be filled with the Spirit, what would you feel like? How much mag more magnified would your joy be over your personal biological child? And the same way with God. He is so happy. That the Gentiles have received the truth and come in. But when the Jewish people recognize him, his own seed, his children, his chosen people, great joy in the heart of God over that. Romans chapter 11 verses 25 through 27. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, which I shall take away their sins. Now in this setting, Paul is going to emphasize the fact that the restoration of Jews is not only possible, but something that God desires to happen, that he wants to happen. Now, Paul starts this little scripture setting off with, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Whenever you read that in Paul's writings, understand that what he's fixing to say is very important. I don't want you to be ignorant of this, what I'm fixing to tell you. So anytime you read that, he has a tendency to, just like he says, God forbid, he's going to say that quite a bit. And he wants you to pay attention, special attention to what he's about to say. He mentions the word mystery. I would not have you ignorant of this mystery. Now, I want you to understand that that word in its Hebrew connotation, connotation here, does not mean something hidden, but a mystery is something that you need a revelation to understand it. So you need a divine revelation to understand it. He uses this later on when he says, great is the mystery of godliness. And the Trinitarians use that to say, well, we don't, because of that, the understanding of how he could be three in one is a mystery. But not in Timothy. He said, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he explains it. For God was manifest in the flesh. The only thing you don't understand is how God could do that. I don't understand how God can make his own flesh inhabit and come to the earth. That's the only mystery. How did you do that? The mystery is not that he did it and who he was. We recognize he was God in the flesh. So when he uses that term mystery, it's not something that's hidden that you'll never figure out. It's that you need a clue. You need a divine revelation to solve that mystery. And the entrance of Jesus Christ into this world and the entrance of his spirit into us gives us that divine revelation. The Bible says the Holy Spirit shall lead and guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is your clue to get an understanding of every mystery that you don't understand. It's not hidden from you. You just have to have the right key to solve the mystery. And then, he, and then he kind of alludes to the fact that, you know, throughout the Old Testament, these prophets spoke of the time when the Jews would reject Christ. They even prophesied of that moment, but they also prophesied of the remnant. So they prophesied both the fact that they would reject, but that some would receive. And then he talks about the fact that they were blind. And when he talks about this, like the hardness of their heart happened in Israel. So they once again rejected Christ as Messiah and Savior. But one good thing came out of their blindness, which was the fullness of the Gentiles had come. In other words, salvation was open to the Gentiles. Paul is not saying anything new that we've not discussed, but he's saying it again. Paul is a teacher. He understands. I have to say this 
maybe three, four, five different ways so that everybody understands me. The blindness or the hardness of the Israelites' heart caused the salvation to be open to the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles have come. And God used the rejection of the Jews and the blindness or hardness of their hearts to open this opportunity of salvation to the Gentiles. But, here's the circle again, that wasn't the end of the Jewish people. And then he speaks this prophecy from Isaiah 59, 20, where it was prophesied that out of Zion there would come a deliverer that would turn the hearts of Israel back to God and away from their ungodliness. Now he's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about the fact that even though some rejected him, not all rejected him, and the ones that didn't reject him received this. Isaiah 59, 20 says it this way, And the Redeemer, capital R, shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So he's saying this remnant of Jacob, this remnant of Israel, that turn from their transgression, the Redeemer has also revealed himself to them was also prophesied by David in Psalm chapter 14, verse 7. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall, re shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. And Paul is saying to these men at Rome, you are the very people that were prophesied about in Psalms and in Isaiah. You are the living proof of this. You believed. You received by faith. You followed the plan of salvation. And God delivered you out. And then Paul concludes that verse 27 with the fact that God has made a covenant that he would not always cut off Israel, but would in fact make sure that there was a remnant, there was a core of his people that were believing and were saved. And that also continued in Isaiah 59. Remember just a while ago, just a moment ago, we read Isaiah 59, 20. But you have to continue in Isaiah 59, 21, because Paul alludes to that in verse 27 as well here in Romans 11. This is what Isaiah 59, 21 says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So God in Isaiah prophesied that there would be a remnant. And Paul is reminding the Jews, you are that remnant. And then in Romans 11 verses 28 through 29, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So once again, Paul says, The Jews that did not recognize and see Jesus Christ as the Messiah, they became the enemies of God for your sake. Speaking to the Gentiles, right? Because they became the enemy of God, he opened salvation to you. But then he said, there is also an election or a chosen people and God loves them and wants them to see them come into the full knowledge of the deity, right? So that's when he says in the end of verse 20, but as touching the election, those chosen Jews, they are beloved for the father's sake. They are loved by God because they are his children coming back to him, recognizing who he is. He, he doesn't want the Jews or the Gentiles to realize that neither one is without hope. He wanted all mankind to be saved, right? But in doing so, one rejects him, one receives him, one turns away from him, one turns towards him. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't love and care for all of them. And he's, he desires to see all of them saved. And then in verse 29, Paul reminds them that whom God chooses, whom he calls, he doesn't change his mind. He uses that terminology, the gifts and callings are without repentance. The word repentance means to turn back, to turn around, to run away. When I give gifts and callings to people, I do not take them away, he says. They choose whether they follow me and I give them more, but I do not take away what I have given them. He will never completely turn away, run away from his chosen people. They are his children. He's like a parent waiting for them to wake up 
to realize their issue, to recognize who Jesus Christ was, to want to see the gospel. Now, when you talk about it this way, it brings to mind the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And I believe that when Jesus spoke that, he was referencing this nation of Israel being as that prodigal son. That son had everything. He was given everything. He was blood lineage of the father. The father, he had everything he could ever want. The father provided for him. He cared for him. He gave him his wealth. When he wanted his inheritance, the father gave him an inheritance. And he, he did not cherish that inheritance. The truth, the children of Israel were the repository of truth. But they didn't cherish it. They even missed the Messiah, everything that they had heard all the prophecies about. Everything they had studied since they were little Hebrew boys of 12 years old. They missed the Messiah when they came away. They were like that prodigal son. They didn't cherish it. They ran away from his house. But God is like that father. He's just waiting for them to recognize him. And when they begin their journey back, he's that father who's waiting for them and watching. The scripture of the prodigal son in Luke 15 says every day the father would go out in the road and he would watch. And when he saw his son, the father left the house and ran to him. That's how God wants to see. He wants to see the Jewish people recognize that he's the Messiah and Savior. And when he does, he's going to run to them. And then we have to be careful, the Gentiles, that we're not like the son that stayed back. And we're not jealous because he's so happy that the Jews are back home. No, we should all rejoice because our brethren have come home. And I hope you see now how that that story that Jesus told in Luke 15 of the prodigal son represented the Jews, the Gentiles, and what was happening. God's gift and calling, his calling and his love, and the Jews as his chosen people and the repository of truth has not changed. That's still upon them. They are still his chosen people. It remains the same. And then Romans 11 verses 30 through 32. For ye, as ye in time past have not believed God, you have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now he's continuing to state it in a different way. This circle, I hope you get this, because in verse 30 he's referencing the Gentiles at the beginning. For as in times past, you have not believed God, that's the Gentiles, but you obtained mercy because of the Jews' unbelief. Even so now, they have the ability to obtain mercy because of your belief. So see how it goes circuit. And then in verse 32, he says, For God hath concluded that them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all of them. So the really the point of this is, Jews' unbelief led to the Gentiles' salvation. The Gentiles' belief leads to the Jews' belief, which then is what Mike came to do, to seek and to save every man, all mankind. And then Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And so it almost seems like Paul wax is poetic here but remember this is the end of this arc of thought that he's been portraying and so he he wants to just basically let them know god in his wisdom and his knowledge designed it this way though you may not understand it and he uses that terminology his unsearchable judgments his ways past finding out that means i don't have any ability to search out why he chose judgment this way I don't have any ability to say, why did you do it that way? Why did some of the Jews have to not believe so the Gentiles could believe? Why did some of the Jews have to be provoked to jealousy so of the Gentiles so they would believe? His unser I don't know why he did it. Oh, the wisdom and knowledge of God, Paul says. His unsearchable judgments. His ways past finding out. Now, the root of that is, what do you need to know why he chose to do it that way? What does it matter to you? Just obey. Just trust and obey. If that's the way you want it, God, that's what I will do. Psalms 119.75 says it like this. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Sometimes we go through hard times, bad times. We don't know why it's happening. But if you trust in your God that his ways are higher, 
He knows what he's doing. His wisdom and his knowledge is greater than you. You trust in his judgment. You trust in what he's doing. God is going to lay out plans you don't understand. What do you mean? I can't explain some things. Maybe not. I can't explain how the plan of salvation is salvation. All I know is God designed it that way and I will follow it and obey it. It's not of me to explain that moment. It's of me to follow, trust, and obey. Paul goes on to say it this way. Who knows the mind of God? Who can counsel him? Very wise words. You need to, you need to understand that you will never fully comprehend an internal, infinite God who sees everything. We see linear. We're in this timeline. We can only see a little bit behind us and a little bit in front of us. God is above time. He is eternal. He saw what happened at the beginning. He's going to see what he knows exactly the date, the time, everything, right? And so because of that, we can't always comprehend him. I don't always know the mind of God. I can't counsel him on what I think is best. I don't have enough brain power to do his job, nor do I want him. I need to leave him alone. I need to believe in him and let him do his job. I need to understand that he loves me. He's my father. He's not going to harm me for needless reasons. He's got a plan and purpose for my life. And when I believe on him, I become his child in a different way. And now all of his blessings and his promises and his coverings come into my life. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.16 does give us a little insight of to what we can know. This Remember when I talked above about a mystery and having the key to know that mystery? For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. When we take on the Spirit of God, when we are filled with the Spirit, now we have a little change in our mind and we can understand divine revelation. We can understand biblical things. But even with that, we may not understand when we go through a hard time. We may not can answer all of those questions. Quit feeling like you have to try it. A big part of serving God is faith and trust. I have faith in him. I trust him. I may not understand everything, but his. I do trust his wisdom. I do trust his knowledge. I do trust his judgments. I do trust his ways are higher than mine. And then in verse 35, Paul says, what have you ever given God that he needs to recompense to you, that he needs to repay to you? <laughs> I've done nothing for God that he needs. In fact, I've probably done things against him that I owe him for. I owed him my debt of sin. But instead he said, I'm going to pay that for you. This is the love that we need to understand. It was not on my own merit. God didn't create a plan of salvation because I deserved it. He created a plan of salvation because he loved me and wanted to save me. In fact, it was because I was unworthy and I couldn't save myself. It was because I didn't merit it that God came down. That's why we have the mercy of God, the grace of God, that unmerited favor, that ability to look beyond our flaws and our faults. That's what mercy and grace is. And because he made the plan of salvation, now I can follow that and be justified my sins taken away and I can stay sanctified, which is in right relationship with him. And then Paul concludes this chapter, this arc by saying for him, through him and to him are all things. Basically, he wraps it up by saying the bottom line is everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. Everything happens through him and everything happens for him. And then he just concludes it and says, then let's just give him glory. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Just glorify him because he's God. God is the source. God is the means. God is the end. We are simply here to give him glory. That's a beautiful conclusion to this little arc that he was talking to the Jews and the Gentiles. I really hope that you enjoyed this. I love chapter 11. Boy, it really encouraged me. I love I, that image I get of the tree and the grafting in. I'm so glad that God grafted me in to that tree. And, and I want to produce the fruit that show that tree. And that's what you should be striving for. And I am so thankful for the unsearchable judgments and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And I do give him glory forever. Amen. Put a period on that. Put an exclamation point on that. That's what we do.
I pray you enjoyed our lesson today. I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday night when we go into Romans chapter 12. We're, we're working our way through this. And I and share this if you enjoyed it today. Like it. Uh, subscribe on our YouTube channel. Like us on our Facebook. Follow us. We've got, we've got videos uh, on our YouTube channel that we're sharing. God has been so good to us. I'm so glad you joined me tonight. And I look forward again to seeing you next Wednesday night. Thank you and God bless you.